So we, um, the recording is in progress. We are going to let some more people filter in here. So while we're waiting, um, we're really, really excited about our presentation today with Dave Keen. Um, ironically, we are both in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, <laughs> doesn't happen too often that um, the host is in my hometown, so it's exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, so just give us a couple more minutes and, and we'll get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mito Action's monthly expert series. I'm Stephanie Harry, one of the patient support coordinators at Mito Action, and I'll be your host for today. Today, Dave Keen, Director of Rare Disorders at Variantrix, will discuss navigating the financial minefield of genetic testing. There are so many misunderstandings and misconceptions of genetic testing. Dave will attempt to clarify these issues and provide tools to empower patients to participate in their care from a financial perspective. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the Mito Action website in the coming days, as well as on our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. If you're joining us via your computer, you should see the presentation on your screen. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar of your screen. If you're calling in via phone, please feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dave Keen. Dave Keen has worked in the genetics testing field since 1998. He became interested in mitochondrial disease in 2004 and has attended almost 20 UMDF symposia. His career has taken him from Athena Diagnostics, Transgenomic, Gene DX, and now Vari Variantrix. He has attended approximately 50 Mito Grand Rounds presented by Bruce Cohen, Summit Parikh, Fran Kendall, Bob Naveau, Amy Goldstein, and many, many others. He works closely with UMDF and Mito Action to facilitate genetic testing for hundreds of Mito patients and has always functioned from the patient comes first perspective. And I love that last part of your bio, Dave, because it's absolutely true. I have known you for almost a year now and feel honored to be on this journey with you here. Um, you absolutely put your patients first in everything that you do and your amazing at what you do and always making sure that the patients get understandable results. You take the time to explain things that don't make sense and you point us all in the right direction. So thank you so much, Dave, for all your work. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so with that, I guess without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. Also, if you guys have any questions, as Stephanie said, um, don't hesitate to, to shout them out. Okay. Come on screen. So can everybody see that? I'm seeing your head nod, Stephanie, so I'll take that as a yes. Okay, so uh, again, the title is Navigating the Financial Minefield of Genetic Testing. Um, basically, there's, as Stephanie mentioned, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, genetic testing, it, uh, the costs associated, and hopefully um, after this talk, things will become a little bit clearer. Um, and uh, those who have not gotten testing will be able to get it. Uh, those who need further testing will be able to uh, explore deeper into their disease state. Oh. It's not advancing. Oh, there we go, sorry. Okay, so <clears throat> the types of uh, mitocentric genetic testing, there's, um, just to be clear, there's nuclear DNA, nuclear genes, there's mtDNA genes. The difference being nuclear genes are in all of your cells. It's the same DNA sequence. Mitochondrial DNA have their own separate um, genes. There's 37 mitochondrial genes and they're in every one of your thousands of mitochondria in every cell. Um, and the uh, the sample types that we would test would be blood, saliva, or cheek swab, and tissue. Um, the tissue would be most important in detecting 
what's called heteroplasmy in some mtDNA cases. So laboratories that uh, mitocentric testing would be sent to that have expertise would be Baylor, GeneX, Variantix, Blueprint, some smaller academic labs like Columbia, Penn, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, et cetera. Um, if the lab that the, your mitocentric testing is being sent to does not have the capability um, to do mtDNA testing, my opinion is it's probably best to avoid them and to find a lab that does have that kind of expertise. Um, also labs with a robust data set um, tend to be able to provide a more comprehensive interpretation of the data. What that means is the more patients they've tested, the more data they have to compare to. So um, there's different types of testing. There's obviously clinical diagnostic testing, uh, research testing and quote unquote sponsored or free testing. Um, research tests are usually no charge, but in most cases they cannot be used to guide your treatment. Now I wanna specify this, there's, um, there's CLIA labs and non-CLIA research labs. CLIA is just a, um, a certification that allows a lab to produce a clinical, clinically actionable result. Um, all of those, whether they're doing it for research or clinically, they can be used to guide your treatment. Um, if it's a non-CLIA research lab, um, they cannot use your data to guide your treatment. And in many cases, they won't even share the results with the physician that referred the patient to that research lab. Um, and again, clinical diagnostic tests are used to guide treatment decisions uh, specifically for the patient and family uh, most labs have you sign an informed consent form that allows that data or that laboratory to use your um, your genetic information for continued research purposes. Uh, the free or sponsored testing. First of all, you have to understand nothing is free. Somebody is paying for that testing. Um, the companies that sponsor testing, primarily their pharma companies, um, they pay the laboratory to run the test on you to keep the patients out of pocket to zero. But then they use that, your DNA, to develop therapies, but then they can also monetize your DNA by, again, selling it down the line. Um, it's not nefarious. It's not evil. It's not um, uh, bad in any way. But also, I don't personally think it's very transparent. Um, and also... If you don't have insurance and you have no way to pay for your testing, sometimes that is the best option um, available to you so that you can get um, some actionable results. Uh, Direct-to-consumer testing. These are things like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, et cetera. Um, I, I can't stress this enough. These are non-diagnostic from a clinical perspective and should be viewed as entertainment only. Um, an example would be um, BRCA, which is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the uh, most well-known and best described breast cancer genes. Um, 23andMe tests for three variants on BRCA1 and BRCA2. They're called the Ashkenazi Jewish variants, but there are hundreds if not thousands of pathogenic variants in the BRCA genes. So if you get a result report from 23andMe, it comes back and says there is nothing found in your BRCA1 or BRCA2. That does not mean you don't have a, a possible pathogenic variant in those genes. It just means that you probably are an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, and this was just a paper that I found that was published earlier this month uh, from the European Journal of Human Genetics on uh, direct-to-consumer testing. And as you can read by the quote, <clears throat> Research by Tandy Connor et al. revealed the direct-to-consumer genetic testing results that showed a positive result for a pathogenic gene variant had a false positive rate of 40% after performing accredited confirm confirmatory testing contributing to the basis of these concerns. So again, like I said, it's for entertainment purposes only. Okay, let's get into the financial aspect of it. So there's the types of insurance, coverages, and costs. So there's three main types of insurance, categories I call them. There's Medicaid, which is run, it's a state-by-state -state program. 
there's Medicare, which is federally funded. And then there's your private insurances, your Blue Cross Blue Shields, United, Aetna, Cigna, et cetera. Um, each one of these have their own genetic testing coverage guidelines and should be available to you online um, if you do a, a quick Google search. <clears throat> and generally speaking, um, in, in regards to mito patients, um, Medicare is the worst um, as far as cover, covering uh, genetic, large scale genetic testing um, for a number of reasons. They, they do not allow for prior authorization. Um, if, they, um, if they deny it, you can't appeal. Um, if you have Medicare, it's usually best to explore cash pay options with the various laboratories. Now, the caveat being some, um, some laboratories will take Medicare for this type of testing. And if they do, you, you should be good to go. Um, but you may have to sign what's called an ABN or advanced beneficiary notice. What that means is since there's no prior auth available, they submit the claim to Medicare. If Medicare denies it, you're on the hook for the entire cost of the test. Uh, that's why I indicated earlier that it's usually best to, to explore the options because that's um, most of the time less expensive uh, an option than rolling the dice with um, the Medicare coverage. Um, Medicaid is state by state dependent. Each one has their own genetic testing guidelines. Some states uh, have wonderful Medicaid uh, genetic testing coverage policies. Some have, uh, frankly, crappy genetic testing coverage. Um, again, they're publicly available. Um, so the cool thing about this is they do allow for prior authorizations. So if you have Medicaid, um, you wanna make sure that a prior authorization is done uh, so that if it's approved, then you know it's not gonna be any cost to you out of pocket. If it's denied, you can actually go through an appeals process. Private insurance tends to be the best in this space because you're an actual customer. They wanna make sure that they keep their customers happy. Um, they allow prior authorizations, they allow appeals, written, written appeals, peer-to-peer -peer reviews, et cetera. Um, however, it is best to go in with eyes wide open and know that your insurance company is not in the business to pay for your health care. They're in the business to not pay for your health care. So more times than not, they will deny um, covering a genetic test uh, out of the box and basically make you or your laboratory or your clinician work for the money to, to cover the test. Uh, so then there's in-network and out-of-network status and why does it matter? Um, as I stated earlier, Medicare will not usually cover this type of testing. So in-network, out-of-network status is irrelevant in most cases. There are exceptions with Medicare Advantage plans, but they act more like private insurance than a federally funded program. Um, Medicaid, it's important for a laboratory to be in-network for a state Medicaid plan. Otherwise, it's 99% certainty that if they're not in network with that state's Medicaid, it will the prior authorization will probably be denied for being out of network. So check with the laboratory um, that your clinician wants to send to. Make if you're on Medicaid to make sure that that network is in that laboratory is in network um, with Medicaid before moving forward, um, because you don't want to get surprised by a big bill. Um, private insurance. There's benefits and drawbacks to being uh, uh, to a lab being in or out of network with a private insurance company. Um, if you're in network, most people know that your your out of pocket deductible is usually lower for an in network laboratory than an out of network laboratory. Um, if you're in network, it's much easier to get a prior authorization for testing if you're in network. Um, however, do if you're in network, there's sometimes restrictions um, built into the contracts, um, specifically in relation to things that are like it says PAP here. That stands for a patient assistance program. Most laboratories have um, an assistance program built in um, that they can reduce your out-of-pocket costs based on financial need. 
And when I say financial need, all they usually require is your household size, how many people are in the house and your household income. And then they each company has its own metrics or a graph, and then they can reduce your out of pocket to X amount of money. Um, but if you're in network with certain insurances like Cigna has a restriction and Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal also has a restriction that if you're in network, you're not, the laboratory is not allowed to apply um, the patient assistance program. So you're, you're, out of, you're out of pocket is you're out of pocket and there's no way to reduce. Again, uh, it's, uh, your doctor is not gonna know this. Most people don't know this. So it, it's imperative that you ask about. It. So what is a benefits investigation? Um, a laboratory or a number of laboratories will do what, uh, what's called a benefits investigation to determine your expected out-of-pocket costs prior to running the test. Um, the benefits investigation basically means that they will contact your insurance company. Um, they will have certain codes that match up with the tests that your, uh, that your doctor ordered along with diagnosis codes based on your diagnosis. And um, with that information, your insurance company uh, will come back and say, their unmet deductible is X amount of money. They have X amount of co-insurance and a $25 copay. So if the laboratory is going to limit your out of pocket to your unmet deductible copay and co-insurance, they can actually come up with a number as to what your out of pocket will be with that, uh, with that cost. And then most insurance companies um, uh, will not pay for, a, for a, if a complex test is ordered um, by your primary care physician. So I kind of jumped ahead there. Um, when doing the prior authorization to move forward with testing, um, it again is important that the test is ordered by the right type of doctor. Um, if you have a, a family medicine doctor that wants to order whole genome sequencing, that is probably not gonna get covered. Um, so you would need to go to a specialist for that kind of thing. Um, there are certain policies that it will come back and say, this does not require a prior authorization. And in those cases, labs will limit your out-of-pocket responsibility, as I said earlier, to your unmet deductible, your copay, and your co-insurance. Um, and most labs will do the BI as a courtesy to the patient, the doctor. Um, others have moved towards requiring the office, the doctor's office or the clinic to do it themselves. Um, beware of this because if the, the clinic or the doctor's office have to do it, it may not, probably won't be completed because frankly, it's not their job. Um, they're in business to provide medical care to their patients, not to ensure that a laboratory gets paid. So balance bill versus non-balance bill. Um, this is also known as the you know, surprise bill after the fact kind of thing. Um, certain labs will balance bill and certain other labs will not. Um, you need to find that out prior to agreeing to go into testing. What balance bill means is that the laboratory will bill you the balance of what your insurance policy does not cover. So for instance, let's say the laboratory submits a insurance company for $5,000 for a test that was run. Your insurance company um, pays a thousand. So then what happens is after they've extend, ex, ex, uh, gone through all the appeals process, at the end of that process, which is months down the road, um, they'll, that laboratory will send you a bill saying your insurance company didn't cover the $4,000 balance. So now you owe that. And you didn't know that going into it. Um, so that's why it's, it's important to find out if your laboratory being used is a balance bill or non-balance bill laboratory. Um, again, uh, no balance bill. The laboratory will tell you usually with uh, a great deal of certainty what, you, what your out-of-pocket test, what your out-of-pocket cost is going to be prior to initiating testing. And then you come to an agreement. Um, and just a, a side note, it's illegal to balance bill Medicaid. So if Medicaid reimburses a dollar 
for a test, the laboratory must accept that and can't bill the patient anything. However, if Medicaid does not pay anything, the lab may bill the patient up to the full amount of the test. Or they, if they're reputable, they will offer uh, a lower cash pay price, pay over time options, et cetera. Um, and lastly, if a test is being done in an institution or an inpatient setting, the laboratory has no control over what that bill is gonna be. That would be handled by the, uh, the hospital or the clinic if they're the ones doing the billing. So you could talk until you're blue in the face about um, you know, lowering the cost to the laboratory. The laboratory will have no say in the matter at all. Um, and also it's, it's important to note that um, legally the, the hospitals can have up to a 300% markup on the cost of a test. If you're getting testing done on an inpatient basis, or through an institution, please ask to speak with a financial care counselor so that you can get some transparency on what it's gonna cost and what you're gonna owe. Okay, cash pay and payment arrangements. Um, pretty much every lab that I'm aware of um, offers a discount cash pay option. Uh, and it's usually, if in certain situations, it's usually the most affordable. Uh, unless you have, you've met your deductible and you met your copay, et cetera. Um, and also laboratories like any other um, private entity will be more than happy to work with you um, to enter into some type of payment plan, uh, et cetera. Just it is important to make sure that the lines of communication stay open between you and the laboratory. If they don't hear from you, um, uh, they're gonna assume the worst that you're just trying to walk out on a bill. So know all of your financial options. Um, uh, most of the time your healthcare provider will not be able to tell you the specifics of the financial component of your testing. Because again, I mentioned earlier, it's not their job. And also they usually use multiple laboratories for multiple testing platforms. And it would be a Herculean task for them to try to keep all of that straight. Um, primarily what they want to deal with is a laboratory that's going to offer their patients certainty. So ask for contact information on the preferred lab and do your due diligence. Um, contact the laboratory yourself to find out, you know, how do I find out what my out of pocket's going to be if the, if the laboratory does not proactively reach out to you? Um, if you reach out to the lab directly, you'll get quicker, more accurate answers than you would if you were to constantly call the nurse um, or the MA or the doctor and leave voicemails and say, you know, what's, what's my cost for this test expected to be, et cetera. As I said, they don't know those answers and they're just gonna forward that information along to the laboratory to, to take care of it. So just be proactive and ask for contact information. Um, and also ask about the financial assistance program that I had mentioned earlier. Again, most have generous programs to reduce your out-of-pocket costs based on income and household size. Sometimes it even reduces your out-of-pocket to zero. So again, don't be shy. Um, it's your money. Um, make sure that you're good stewards with it. Um, again, this is, uh, I can't stress this aspect enough. Um, this is not a static environment. This um, financial slash billing uh, policies for laboratories change all the time. So again, don't be shy. Please always ask questions. Demand concrete answers on what your out-of-pocket will be. Don't accept, well, we expect it's gonna be $200. Well, when they say we expect it's gonna be $200, say, well, what would the maximum be? If they can't provide you an answer, um, you know, it, it may be best to explore other options. And resources, obviously, Mito Action, the wonderful people here um, that uh, invited me to speak, um, the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, mitosoc.org, um, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, and lastly, this is my contact information. Um, please don't hesitate to send me an email or give me a call or send me a text. I'm usually available 24-7 uh, unless I'm asleep or on a plane.
So with that, I guess we'll open it up to questions, Stephanie. All right, thank you so much, Dave. This is really, really helpful. Um, and we have some questions that have come in. Feel free to, you can unshare your screen if you'd like, um, and then people get the full view as you're talking. Um, and know that we are opening up for questions now. So if you're on your computer and you'd like to submit a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A spot or feel free to put it in the chat and we can read your questions. Otherwise, if you're on your phone, you can also submit your questions to info at mitoaction.org. So some of the questions um, that have filtered in, one was how do you know how robust a particular lab is like when you're trying to decide because you talked about you know some labs have different amounts of um, information available so the more information you have the more um, the more the lab will be able to I guess fig figure out like how do you know when a lab um, has a certain amount of a data set available and how do you know if a lab is um, a CLIA lab versus a non-CLIA lab as you were talking about that. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll address the second point first. The CLIA lab versus non-CLIA lab, it would all be online. If um, if a doctor is going to use, you know, just pick a lab, GDX, Baylor, whoever, Variantix, uh, if you go to their website at the very bottom of the everybody's homepage, it'll usually say CLIA license number, CAP license number. CAP stands for College of American Pathologists, which is a little bit more... Um, strenuous um, guidelines to, to get CAP accreditation than CLIA is. But CLIA just means that they're able to provide um, a clinical test result. Um, if they don't have it, and the other thing is you can obviously just, everybody's got an 800 number, just say, are you a CLIA certified lab? And if so, get their CLIA number if, if you're so inclined. And I apologize, oh, the, the data sets. Um, again, you can ask, you know, how many patients have you tested um, for this disorder? Um, there's internal private databases, but there's also very large external publicly available databases um, that laboratories all use. Things like ClinVar, which some of you may or may not have heard of before. Um, it's a government run organization where laboratories basically dump all the genetic information they find into ClinVar. So if you were, uh, if you had a variant of uncertain significance, let's say, uh, as your test result, um, if you have that information, you can go onto ClinVar and type in your variant. Um, and then it'll pop up if anybody else uh, has been reported to have that variant as well. So um, it's not easy to find that information, the, the the robustness of a data set. Uh, most companies don't really like sharing that information, but if you ask uh, from a patient's perspective, um, they would probably give you a half decent answer. Okay, so most of the time, the different labs don't share information amongst each other outside of the ClinVar mechanism that you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, ClinVar is just one of them. There's a, uh, there's a thing called Nomad. There's, again, like I said, there's about, I guess between five and seven well-known, well-documented, um, publicly available databases that uh, laboratories will utilize to make sure that, um, you know, if somebody else found this variant and it was not published, why wasn't it published? But then they can do that. And also there's a, an organization called Gene Matcher um, that if you find something um, and you go into ClinVar, and you found that there was a doctor who tested somebody in the Netherlands that had the exact same variant that they did, Gene Matcher will ask to put um, your doctor in touch with their doctor so that they can compare and contrast the symptoms of the patient and the family. And then they can actually sometimes make a call to say, well, this matches up really, really well. We know that this is a loss of function gene. Um, it may be the reason why your symptoms are what they are. Um, if it's obviously not a good match, then they can move on from there. But those, those are just some of the tools available to laboratories and to patients. Okay. 
we have some um, questions coming in here and I'm um, guys I'm I'm going to get to them all. I'm not going to read them in order because there's one that just came in that's kind of related to what we're talking about. Um somebody asked um how are these databases kept safe and how do they protect patient information? Okay, that's actually a really good question. Um none of the companies that uh, dump this data into ClinVar provide the data to ClinVar or any of the public available databases use any um personal health information or PHI. Um, it's just um, a number, and this variant was found, and it's up to the laboratory to uh, provide as much or as little correlating clinical information. Sometimes a laboratory will just say, um, we found all these variants, and that's it. They won't sh share anything about, you know, did the patient have seizures? Did the patient have myopathy? Did the patient have ADHD? Whatever. Um, others will provide very detailed um, breakdown of the symptoms uh, on the variant that they found. So, and that's something that's in ClinVar that you can actually readily look up. But again, so, it's, like I said, it's um, it's de-identified data. Um, so what? Why do DNAs, um, why do DNA tests vary so much in price uh, between companies and how do clinicians choose which um, company to go with? And, and then you also mentioned, you also mentioned the importance of like, if you're going through your PCP, there's that dilemma, right? Like if you're going through your PCP, you might not be able to get coverage, but sometimes like you can't get in to see a genetics doctor until you have a diagnosis. And so if your PCP shouldn't be ordering the test um, so you can see a genetics doctor who, like is it a neurologist normally or a specialty doctor that has the ability to order those tests? So I realize there's a couple parts to this question. Yeah, the as far as the specialist is concerned, um, there's different levels of specialty based upon um, the presentation or symptoms of the patient. So. Um, if it's neurologically based, if it's, you know, like I said, seizure earlier, then a neurologist can usually get these tests covered. Um, if it's, uh, you know, diabetes related, which is a, a, a big issue within the mito community, um, an endocrinologist can get these tests covered. Um, if it's cardiomyopathy, a cardiologist can get these covered. It's just a matter of having some level of expertise within the area in which they're testing the patient. It doesn't always have to be a geneticist, but geneticists generally get better coverage in requesting genetic testing than non-geneticists do. And I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of your question. The first, the first part of the question, I'm sorry, it kind of trailed very long in there, but the first part of the question is why do DNA tests vary so much in price? And how do clinicians choose which, you know, if they wanna go with gene DX versus variantrix versus like, how do they choose? Okay, I mean, there's different testing platforms um, uh, cost different amounts of money to run a test. Um, the, um, the chromosomal microarray is a standardized test that's run all the time. It's relatively inexpensive, it's fast. Um, but then when you get deeper into next generation sequencing, um, there are increased costs. Um, the interpretation aspect is also huge that how much, how many human eyeballs are on a result as opposed to just running it through a computer program to get a, um, a diagnosis. There's, it's multifactorial as to why a test costs what it costs. Um, so, but by and large, because of competition, most tests within the same category are in the same ballpark. Um, an exome is gonna have X amount of cost. A genome will have X amount of cost. Um, a panel test will have X amount of cost, et cetera. And so when we're talking about costs, when one of the patients, they have an FSA account and they were curious how do FSA accounts figure in, in some of these finances, like these um, FSA accounts um, you know you have to use it before 1231 or you lose it kind of a situation. And if the, I guess, I think what they're asking is maybe if the testing takes longer than like 
you know, the end of the year, if you're kind of like mid, like how does that work with your FSA? And if I'm yeah, asking that incorrectly, feel free to correct, correct me no, from, in the mean, chat. <laughs> it's a, it, because genetic testing is not um, like getting a, your regular blood work up from Quest where um, you go see the doctor and they send you down the hall, you get your blood drawn from Quest and then two days later you get your result report. Genetic testing very rarely is that fast. So there's a thing called date of service, which means it's uh, it's either when the blood was drawn or when the test was initiated, and that's your date of service. So if it happens before 1231, you're good to go. It's if the, if, even if the test doesn't result out for six months, it would still count as the date of service falling within your um, uh, financial savings account time of year. So just make sure you know what the date of service is and then that way it would be appropriate. Okay, okay, that's super helpful. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that tissue is needed for mtDNA heteroplasty testing. Um, do you know what type of tissue works well? Um, and is there a, a least invasive option um, for, for testing? Is there? A... Yeah, it's not necessary, um, but with levels, of, I don't want to get too deeply into the weeds with heteroplasmy, but uh, if you have an, an mtDNA variant, like I said, each one of your mitochondria and your cells, there's thousands of mitochondria in every cell. Um, the tissue that would be most appropriate is the tissue that is most affected. So if you have muscle weakness or myopathy, the best gauge for what your heteroplasmy level would be would be to take muscle. If you have seizures, the best would be brain. Um, the issues are nobody wants to have somebody cut into their head and nobody wants to have somebody cut into their thigh. So um, there's the cheek swabs are usually the best and saliva are usually the best. Blood is a good analog, but because blood cells turn over every two weeks, um, it's, it's, um, it's less precise, but it gives you a, a guideline. You can have, uh, let's say 60% heteroplasmy in your muscle, but only show 10% heteroplasmy in blood. But it's just, it, it's used as an analog tissue because it's so much less invasive than taking 250 milligrams of muscle from your thigh and having to go undergo general anesthesia, et cetera. So, or taking a liver biopsy and, you know, brain biopsy, what have you. Nobody wants to go through that. No, I'd say <laughs> not. <laughs> um, one patient said that 10 years ago, I was told there was a 20% chance of a mitodiagnosis with genetic testing in children less so in adults. Are the stats the same on this today or how has genetic testing um, changed? And I know we were talking about that earlier, like um, what you're able to find through genetic testing just even the last couple of years has changed mm -hmm. tremendously. Yeah, it's um, there's a couple of aspects to this, uh, both from an adult versus pediatric patient population. Um, nuclear genes are usually responsible for about 75% of pediatric onset mitochondrial disease and mtDNA is about 25%. Those numbers are flipped if it's a late onset disease that most of the time in adults, it's mtDNA versus nuclear DNA. Um, and as far as um, what we're finding, it's, it's kind of a dual edged sword because years and years and years have, have gone by that mitochondrial disease was a very um, symptom-based diagnosis. There weren't a lot of good genetic tools. We just didn't know enough. So if you had these symptoms, we just, you know, assumed you had high elevated lactate, you had, um, uh, you know, certain organic acids, whatever. Um, we suspect that you have mitochondrial disease or a muscle biopsy, they'd find ragged red fibers, what have you. Um, and so they would just classify you as having mitochondrial disease. Now, as genetic testing has advanced, a lot of mitochondrial patients have been reclassified because whereas they had mito looking symptoms, they actually had a completely different disease. Um, but by the same token, patients who were 
diagnosed as having, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome or um, another atypical thing um, have been molecularly confirmed as having a mitochondrial disease. So I, I don't know that I could put a percentage on it, but advances have been made on both sides of the coin. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's an exciting, exciting process. Um, the, another patient asked, what is, um, if you could explain a little bit about cash pay cost for whole genome sequencing and um, how assistance um, plans work through like Variantrix. Sure. Um, again, most places have a cash pay option. Um, and it depends on what test is ordered. The patient specifically mentioned whole genome sequencing. So with whole genome sequencing, the cash pay price is gonna be in the thousands of dollars. Uh, it's just, it's a very expensive test to run. Um, and there's just no getting around that if, it's, if you're gonna go cash pay. But by the same token, if your deductible happens to be $10,000, and you can get a whole genome test for $2,500, that's a better deal to pay cash than it is to have to pay the $10,000. Um, and again, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Oh, no, uh, they were just curious about um, how that worked with Variantrix. So I think that you answered. Oh, the, the, the patient assistance program part? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So again, um, at and I mean, I, I know that this is usually... Uh, at most laboratories that somebody from the laboratory will reach out to you to let you know what your out-of-pocket is going to be. If that out-of-pocket is on the high side, um, a laboratory will, well, they should offer it, but not all labs offer it. They wait for you to ask for it. So that's why in my presentation, I said, make sure you ask, do you have a patient assistance program? And then the patient assistance program kicks in and like I said, you'd have to provide your household size and your income. Um, and as a, uh, some use a percentage, like for instance, GeneDx uses a percentage number, that if your household income, and these are not exact numbers by any stretch of the imagination, I'm just using them for easy math. If you're, you have a family of four and your household income is $100,000, they'll reduce your out-of-pocket costs by 90%. Um, it very antics, it's the same thing, but we use um, a hard number, a hard dollar number that your maximum out of pocket will be X amount based on if you fall under these categories. The, like I said, there's a grid that household size on one um, part of the graph and income on the other. And then it comes to a box and it says that's how much the test will cost. So if you live in a remote area, how do you navigate where to get tested and like where like how does how does that work if you live in in Nebraska and you're and you're out very rural like how do you do you need to go to a special site and in, in order to get your blood drawn does the lab work with you to explain like how to do that if you call the lab or if if your doctor calls the lab how does that work yeah there's uh, there's a number of options available to you now actually because um one of the upsides of the pandemic, if you will, is the increased usage of telemedicine that you now can see a geneticist um, over your computer. Um, you don't actually have to fly to the Mayo Clinic to see somebody, they'll, they'll see you virtually. Um, and as far as collecting the sample is concerned, um, most laboratories accept saliva and cheek swab samples. Um, if you were, if you or your doctor are adamant about using blood, um, again, Variantix, GeneDx, most labs do have a home blood draw service, or they'll have um, a means by which you could go to your local community hospital and, and get your blood drawn um, with their kit, and it'll have a prepaid FedEx air bill, and you just have to drop it off. Okay. And can you explain a little bit more about why Medicare doesn't often cover any of this testing or yeah, Medicaid? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively simple in the sense that um, Medicare guidelines will only cover testing if there's a therapy. That's the general rule of thumb. They, they tend to cover cancer testing very well. 
um, from a genetic perspective. But for things where there's not a like, you know, Huntington's disease, there's no, you know, you pick the disease that's genetic in origin that affects an older patient population. If there's not a therapy, then Medicare is not going to cover it. That's that's kind of the rule of thumb. Okay. And so and and when I say a therapy, I mean obviously there's things like the mito cocktail that patients would take. Um, that they don't classify that as a therapy. Those are just supplements that are available over the counter. So what do you do if you have a geneticist that maybe feels like a similar way? Like you have a genetic diagnosis, but you're having trouble with, but maybe there's other things going on. And so you want to do more genetic testing to see, to rule out other things. Um, but if your geneticist doesn't really think you need to get more genetic testing, like how does that um, play into things like th these tests, they, they have to be, a doctor has to request them, right? Like I, as a patient can't just be like, I want to get this done and call Variantrix and be like, I want to get this done. Correct. The, you, the, a patient can't drive their genetic testing order. It's got to be done by a doctor with a, what's called an NPI number, national provider identifier number. Um, and if you, this is a, um, an issue that comes up periodically where a patient and their physician will have differences of opinion on, you know, what's the next step. And if a doctor does not feel that um, genetic testing will provide any relevant data um, at this time, um, one of two things it, it's incumbent upon you, one, find another doctor, get a second opinion, um, or two, engage them and find out why. Um, why they feel that way. Um, there's also the possibility that uh, if you've had whole genome sequencing, there's nothing else to do. We, we've reached the end point of our, the knowledge base of how we are able to sequence DNA. And if you've reached that end point, you're, you're just going to have to sit and wait for a new technology to come up. Yeah. And that's really hard. It's really hard when you've reached yeah. kind of that yeah. end and you you know, have an answer. I mean, we had spoken earlier, Stephanie, about um, my attitude is that if genetics were a baseball game, we'd be in the top of the second inning. There's still so much that we need to learn. Um, and we just, we have to wait. We, we you know, it, it's just going to take time. Um, but thank goodness that the technology is advancing uh, at a very rapid pace. So it's just going to take time and diligence for the information to catch up. So if I'm a patient and I run into that, that end that, that you talked about where there's, there's no clarification right now, but maybe I have variants of unknown significance, like that popped up, but there's at that point, like what does a company like Variantrix or GeneDx, like what do they do with that information? And, and do they have the capability of like rerunning my labs, you know, maybe a couple years from now when there is more information, maybe something's changed. Yes, that's a, that's a great question, and a, there's a two-part answer to that. One is um, most laboratories will provide one free reanalysis of your data because your, your, your genetic sequence is not going to change over time, um, but the knowledge base will. So if you had a test a couple of years ago that had uh, two or three variants of unknown significance um, and your data was not reanalyzed, Call your doctor and say, uh, can I get a reanalysis of my data? Or, you know, if uh, you can call the laboratory and ask them, but they're, they're going to tell you that they need the order from your doctor. Um, so you can get a reanalysis. And then subsequent to that, um, you can actually pay for future reanalyses as well. Um, usually it's between five and a thousand dollars, five hundred and a thousand dollars to reanalyze the data. Um, and, oh, and the, the other part is, if you had a variant of uncertain significance, um, and that variant, uh, there was just a paper published last month, let's say, that your variant has been identified as being pathogenic in a number of patients. And that data was not available nine months ago. Um, if, um, sorry, something just popped up and lost my turn of thought. Um, if that occurs and the laboratory tests a patient with the same thing, 
and that variant changes from a classification of variant of uncertain significance to likely pathogenic or pathogenic, that'll pop up in the, in the database within the laboratory and they will reach out to your doctor and say, there's been a change to one of your patient's variants. Would you like that information? Oh, but they, wow. But they don't, the, just to be clear, nobody that I'm aware of does that proactively. It's only if something pops up in a new patient for a new test. Because I mean that, again, to go through the hundreds of thousands of patients that they've tested annually, just to look to see if a variant has changed by uh, researching all the various publications and databases, that would take an army of people. So yeah. that's why it, it's not done proactively, but reactively. So if I'm a patient and I get a test done today or whatever, and um, five years from now, can I call the lab back and ask, hey, can you relook at, you know, like rerun yeah. those items? Yes. Okay. So it's yeah. something that you keep that information forever. And I always, you know, have, act or the doctor, is, the doctor. Forever is a long time. I mean, <laughs> um, but most laboratories have uh, a very long time frame for which they maintain data. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so for folks that had whole exome testing with no findings, now, the, it might be hard to classify a percentage, but um, what percent of folks get results for home genome testing these days? Um, or how maybe you could explain like how those tests are, are different? Sure. Um, very briefly, uh, just again, I don't want to get into the weeds with the science, but um, the whole exome sequencing is they test only your exons, which is the protein coding part of your DNA which only makes up 2% of your DNA. Um, whole genome sequences everything, all the stuff in between the exons, um, and that's about 98% of your DNA. So from a number standpoint, you can see why analyzing whole genome data is much more costly than analyzing whole exome data. Um, as far as where our knowledge base is now, most of what we know to be pathogenic or disease causing is in the exons. Um, we're finding obviously as the information increases and in research advances that there's more pathogenic variants being found in the intronic regions, um, or the stuff between the exons. And um, as a percentage, I can only tell you at Variantix, we have a 17% rate of negative exomes being positive on genome. Wow, that's pretty good though. Uh, but it's, I, I'd be cautious about hanging my hat on that as a um, routine number. It, it's a lot of it has to do with um, patient selection that if a patient's phenotype changes, for instance, um, where they get another symptom added to it, it increases the ability of the data scientists to analyze um, what was there in the first place to, oh, wait a minute, you know what? We did see this, it was classified as a VUS, but now we know with this new symptom, it's probably pathogenic. So it's, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but that's the internal numbers that we have. Do you know if, um... Do you know if geneticists typically have a preferred lab that they go to? Like if I am being seen by a neurologist and it's going to take me six months to get into my geneticist and, um, and we're thinking, well, maybe I could get some testing done now. Like, is it, is that something that they should talk to the geneticist about before ordering or do they normally do that just to make sure that like, I don't get to my geneticist and they're like, yeah, we really want you to get it done at this lab when you've already gotten it at this lab or. Yeah, I mean, most like anything, most human beings have preferences for what they think is best or, you know, less expensive versus useless. You know, there's a number of different, um, uh, you know, factors that would go into why a doctor likes lab A versus lab B. Um, some of them are rational. Some of them are irrational. Um, I, I hate that rep. I'm not going to order anything from them. 
It might be a very good lab, but they're just oil and water, the doctor and the rep. Um, so uh, as far as, unless it's like a, you know, Joe's lab and grill, um, you know, most uh, specialist physicians will order from an accredited laboratory. So it may not be the best test available, but it'll be a pretty good test. And if it's a situation where you get an answer, great. Um, if you don't, um, you have at least something to go to your geneticist with. And then they'll say, well, this lab's a piece of crap. I don't want to use them. I'm going to test you again using this lab. So that's kind of how it would run. And that's really helpful because I think like as a patient, when you're trying to get tested, there's so many questions that you're trying to sort through and like, where do you need to advocate for yourself versus where do you, you know, just kind of like, let it go. Like, you know, yeah. it, it's okay for my doctor just to kind of make that decision. You know, I don't need to ask a billion and one questions about that per se. Um, so, and I think that goes with, with everything that you've talked about today. I mean, you've answered a lot of important questions and mm -hmm. I feel like, um, I have better informed me and I'm sure many of other patients of how to better engage as they're pursuing genetic testing and when to ask questions and who to ask questions of, which is so, so important. So I really appreciate all that you addressed and, and, and every way that you've helped in that way. So I don't know if you have any last food for thought that you'd like to share. Um, just like I said, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and don't be, if you think it's a stupid question, I'm, I guarantee you a hundred patients before you have had the same thing pop into their head and they may or may not have asked it. So um, just, just don't be shy. And if you are shy, um, they can reach out to Mito Action um, and talk to the good people there. If, if you're, you know, is this a stupid question kind of thing? You can talk to the people at Mito Action because they're just like you. There are people out to try to help you. Um, if you didn't want to ask your doctor, you can ask Mito Action um, and they'd be more than happy to, you know, help with an answer, guide you in that direction. Thank you so much, Dave. And I, yeah, I absolutely agree. I, and I can echo that, that there are no stupid questions. And so um, absolutely as patients, we have to ask our questions and mm -hmm. um, and not be afraid to. And, and you're right, sometimes it's helpful to ask those in safe places before you bring them to the doctors, um, but know that you're not alone in, in asking those questions. So thank you again so much, Dave, for your time and um, your presentation. As a reminder, today's presentation will be posted on our website for anyone who would like to listen again, share with others, Others or go back at a later date and listen. You can also find the full catalog of expert series presentations on Apple Podcast, Google Play, and Spotify, and on our website at www.mitoaction.org. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care. Bye. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if anybody did had a question that didn't get addressed, please feel free to reach out directly to me. Um, through Stephanie and my election. Thanks so much, Dave. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.